Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Q&A about history of science and technology. I see there are a bunch of interesting questions here. Gosh, where to start? Uh, there's a comment and question from Matt, who says, what's the history behind emails and instant messaging? They say, I have a hard time imagining life before then and handling communication that may not get a response for days waiting for a letter in the mail. Okay, so I'm an old guy. So I existed long before, uh, well, a fair time before um, email and so on. Let me make a few comments. First of all, the postal service in many places was really surprisingly efficient. For example, I was studying the history of Ada Lovelace and Charles Babbage, who were active in the 1830s, 1840s. They both lived in London. They lived, I don't know, a mile and a half apart or something. And at that time in London, there were 40 mail deliveries per day. And so you see in the archives of uh, Ada and Babbage's stuff, you see um, actual letters exchanged multiple per day, very much like email. So this idea that the, that things were sort of slow, communication was slow, is really not true for the time of, uh, you know, I don't know how many mail deliveries there are in central London today. I bet it's a lot less than 14. But back in those days, there were lots of mail deliveries. I'm, I'm sure that what's uh, determined mail deliveries is part it's the you know, cost of labor and things like that. Maybe when there, if you know, there are robotic mail deliveries, it'll be up to lots of physical deliveries per day. Um, I'm not sure what, uh, I don't think we're quite there yet in terms of those little trundling robots that you see in, in some places these days. Um, I think, and, and uh, we're, we're not there in terms of what people thought maybe five years ago, that there'd be you know, flying drone deliveries all over the place. That, that has not come to pass as of yet. Um, I, the I, I mean the kind of the uh, yeah the, the 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 kind of image of of things that could go wrong there is is uh, can get quite um, quite diverse, but in terms of of um, electronic communications, um, the you know the thing that really opened all that up was the telegraph, which was I think eighteen thirties maybe Samuel Morse and people like that inventing Morse code and people wiring up um, uh, telegraph lines all over the place. I, I mean, I should say, by the way, in terms of, of mail delivery, um, I don't know what the sort of peak mail delivery in, um, in the US has ever been. I'm sure New York City will have been the place where there will have been the most of it. Um, there were lots of things in infrastructure in New York City, for example, that uh, have kind of mostly gone away but were allowed for pretty rapid communication. For example, in tall buildings, the idea of pneumatic tubes that would go from floor to floor, where you would put your um, your message in a tube and you would you would specify where that how that tube was going to be routed through the building, and then somebody would pick up the tube at, at the other end. I mean, I remember years ago um, that uh, 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 when FedEx was a was a young company in the 1980s. Um, the uh, um, uh, um, having kind of uh, realizing that one was sending a FedEx from a company that was on one floor of a building in New York City to another floor of the building in New York City, but FedEx was routing all of its traffic through its hub in Memphis, Tennessee. And so that, that letter was almost certainly going from one floor of the building to Memphis, Tennessee, and back to another floor of that building. So, you know, these technologies do tend to sort of uh, circulate around. Um, and I think, uh, uh, but, you know, pneumatic tubes was an interesting technology. But back to the electronic side of it, you know, the telegraph was sort of the earliest uh, story of, um, of kind of, um, um, uh, of, of, a, of a way to communicate. Um, electronically across, you know, across large distances. And, uh, you know, it became sort of a premium thing to be a very fast clicker of the, um, of the telegraph key and so on, um, and a telegraph operator. In terms of people's sort of general communication, 
uh, you know, letters, obviously, in a country like the US, it's pretty big. Um, the plenty of letters were quite slow. And, you know, there were exotic things like the Pony Express, you know, riding from one side of the country to another, and so on. I mean, another thing to realize about letter mail, when I was a kid, um, you know, airmail was a, a non-trivial concept. You know, you would send a letter by airmail, and you would typically have these little blue uh, kind of um, envelopey things that folded up that were incredibly thin paper, so that the, um, you know, the airmail letter was very light so that you could um and and i think you know when the first um uh mail services by plane came into existence shortly after the the development of planes um the uh you know people would pack lots and lots of these airmail letters that had to be really light to be able to um uh to you know to go from here to there i i, I seem to remember at least in england the airmail letters um had sort of you would buy a form letter thing that would fold up and it would have its stamp already on it. And um, that was, so its stamp was sort of built into the, the airmail construct. And that would be the thing that was used to pay for it. Now, you know, at some point in the, in the exchange of letters, there's this non-trivial thing that there are, you know, a couple of hundred countries in the world and how a letter goes from one country to another and so on is not such a trivial thing because you have to have what is it, the International Postal Union or something has to make deals with, oh, you, you know, somebody bought the stamp in country one, but it's going to be, the letter is going to be delivered in country two. How does that work? How do you kind of clear the, um, the, the sort of the expense? Because maybe more, many more people are writing, you know, from the US to country X than are writing from country X to the US, those kinds of things. In any case, back to sort of the origins of, of things like email. So there were there were telegrams, uh, which were sort of standardized places to send uh, uh, telegraph messages for, you know, you could have a telegraph message that was sent um, uh, by, um, uh, I guess, was sent from one sort of company or, or to another, um, you know, particularly in the case of financial kinds of transactions, things like this. But then there was kind of the consumer end of it, which was in the US Western Union, I guess, was the, the organization that did most of that, where you would just show up at a Western Union sort of place and say, I want to send a telegram to somebody else. And then, uh, you know, that would be that would be sent by telegraph and then uh, this printed out at the other end. And, uh, you know, I think telegrams, when did they stop being a thing? I sent a telegram in 1984, three, 1983, but they were definitely by that time kind of really making a point exotic uh, kinds of communications. They had definitely gone gone out of circulation. Now, now one thing that came in, and I'm I'm kind of giving you this history in a slightly peculiar order, but one thing that came in was the fax machine. So, you know, the concept of taking a telegraph, a telegraph, and using it to transmit kind of digital image data that you could reconstruct as an image was a, a concept that had existed even in the early 1800s. I and mean, I think famously, I think uh, Gauss who did a bunch of astronomy work, had, you know, an observatory at the top of a mountain and, you know, his office down at the bottom of the mountain and things, and I think had some early kind of proto-fax machine based on, on the telegraph. But the actual concept of the fax machine and its sort of electronic implementation didn't come in until uh, the early 80s. Um, and actually, part of what I think enabled that was compression technology because you know most of a piece of paper that you might transmit is blank, and so you typically it's using run length encoding where you're just saying there are lots of pixels and there are a thousand identical pixels. So just say there's it's this pixel color and copy it a thousand times, and that was the sort of uh, compression technique used for typical faxes. But faxes came in, uh, I think when was it early 1980s. Um, they were sort of started arriving. And it was, it was an interesting economic moment because I remember that FedEx, for example, in its early days had a thing I think was called Zap Mail, which was a 
same day, few hour delivery service. And it worked by you have a message, it would then get faxed to the destination, which was another FedEx office. And then they would dispatch somebody to go deliver the, the printout of that message. It was interesting that that service lasted only a very short time because the cost curves for fax machines were being driven at such a rate that it quickly became possible for, for sort of individual people to have fax machines. And, and that happened, when did that happen? That was like um, mid 1980s, it became common to have a fax machine and to have, and, and I certainly remember when we started Wharton Research, in 1986, it was absolutely, uh, you know, there was a in fact, we still have the same fax number. I'm sure if you send a fax number, you know, uh, to um, uh, uh, the, 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 there's, there's a fax number, which I'm sure has been the same since 1986 for Wolfram Research. And I, I don't know quite what happens to a fax that's sent there anymore. I'm sure it's transmitted electronically, uh, you know, by, by, by computer at this point to something. Um, but that was that was another kind of form of um, of fast messaging was was the fax machine idea. Another thing that had been an earlier idea that existed from the 1930s, I think, maybe 40s, was the telex machine. Telex machine was kind of a uh, a well, let's see, that was a kind of a merger of phone technology and a sort of telegraph transmission of, um, uh, of, of, of kind of written material. And so a telex machine, you would typically, you would dial a number, but then you would have a piece of paper tape. It was five hole paper tape usually. You would have pre-typed your message because you didn't want to be on the phone very long because you were often sending it to another part of the world. Um, you would uh, uh, have, have typed your message so that it was, recorded on the paper tape, then as soon as the telex connects, you would start off the paper tape going through and it would send that those that digital data through to the other end. And then at the other end, the telex machine would print out the message. And that was another kind of fast way of uh, communicating before there was email. Well, the first email that I used was uh, actually on an MIT, the MIT MC computer, MIT multiple access uh, computer, um, which was a node of the ARPANET. Um, at that time, the ARPANET had 512 nodes, I think. This was around 1986. And um, at that time, you could log in, you could create an account on this kind of public access computer. And when you created an account, you had to have a username. And um, uh, once you had that username, people on that computer could send you messages under that username. And so that was a, that was a thing. Uh, I was very sad that my, um, the obvious SW username for me was taken when I first logged into that um, uh, computer in 1986 from, from England or whatever over the ARPANET. Um, uh, and so I, I picked Swolf, SWOLF, which was for a long time my, my login. Um, and uh, I, many, many years later, I met the person who had the SW for that machine. But um, in any case, the um, uh, uh, but but on that machine, local to that machine, you could get messages. And you know, I, I still have messages that were sort of email messages that were sent locally to that machine. When things jumped sort of to other machines. The primary place I saw that was in this thing called UUCP, the Unix to Unix copy system. And what would happen there was that there was a place where there was email, but you would typically give your, like, like for example, I was at the Institute for Advanced Study and it had um, a, uh, maybe I even set this up, I'm not even sure. Um, you, would, you would want to, at that, that time, this is early 1980s, you would be wanting to send a message to somebody and the address would look like machine name, exclam, machine name, exclam, machine name, and so on. Because what was happening was that one machine was calling on the phone, another machine using a, a modem and uh, you know communicating through a modem. Then it was calling another machine. It was kind of a routing of a message 
from through quotes email, but you were explicitly saying you go from this machine to this machine to this machine to get to where you want to go to. Now, there were a few competing networks. There was a thing called BitNet, which I think IBM put up, that was for universities. Uh, then there was, um, uh, and, and that was another thing that had, well, people would have BitNet addresses and they would have UUCP addresses and so on. I remember when I started the Complex Systems Journal in 1986, we had all sorts of exotic uh, sort of email-like addresses that could be used to submit papers electronically. It was the, the very first journal that could take um, electronic submissions of papers back in 1986. I, I have to say, I was a little bit embarrassed, you know, 20 years later when I realized we hadn't actually updated the instructions to contributors in 20 years, and we were still talking about bitnet and floppy disks and things like this. But that was a um, uh, that was kind of the the early days of that. Now, now then, in uh, uh, by the time I started our company in, in 1986, um, there were things were becoming a bit more standardized, and you could you know buy blocks of IP addresses. Um, we had 140.177 um, was uh, our Class B address block that we that we bought back in 1986, um, and uh, eventually became quite valuable. We actually sold part of it recently um, at. Uh, uh, because we didn't need uh, that whole collection of, of addresses. And uh, there's, a, there's a, a real um, uh, dearth of, of um, IPv4 addresses at the present time. Um, so, but uh, that was a thing by 1986, people were sort of more routinely um, uh, using email. I remember actually, um, just to give a sense of sort of the, the arrival of email, um, the uh, even by the 1993, I remember actually going the one time I went to the World Economic Forum um, uh, meeting, um, talking to all kinds of people there who were sort of thinking about the world and the future and all that kind of thing, and telling them you should really pay attention to the the internet and um, you know and email and so on and they, they still that wasn't wasn't yet a thing by 1993 that that was it was just sort of people had heard of it but it wasn't yet kind of a thing so but there was so you know this idea of kind of uh, you know everybody could connect to the internet and um use email was was something that sort of a, a I, I suppose a a, a mid 90s kind of thing now meanwhile there had been CompuServe and AOL and so on and CompuServe must have existed in, oh, let's see, that must have existed in the early 1980s because I remember meeting one of the people who had been a founder of that or who, who had been sort of ejected from it actually, uh, meeting them around 1983 and that it was already past history. So that had existed as a thing that you dialed into using, I guess, the very first generation of personal computers. Uh, so I suppose there were there were these different kinds of networks. There were ones that you could connect to with a, you know, a personal computer, and then it was all sort of server-based. And there are ones where you actually had your computer do things like call another computer. That was typically done by things like mini computers. Uh, by mini computer, I mean these computers that were size of a, you know, large desks and things, things like the VAX. Uh, uh, computer, they were called mini computers because they were much smaller than mainframe computers. So there was a bit of a disorganized um, um, uh, response here about about um, messaging. I, I mean, I suppose that um, uh, what is curious is that a lot of the, uh, the the kind of the mechanisms of SMS, for instant messaging, and so on. You know, a lot of that kind of the the at least the conventions for how that worked sort of were a bit derived from the way that people used to write telegrams and so on. Um, and, uh, 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 you know, I think even the original Twitter 140 character limit was derived from sort of a telegram um, type uh, 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 convention. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I, I think by when? I mean, by some time in the early 90s, by mid 90s probably, it was, uh, I mean, there was a time when it was very exotic to have an email address. And 
that became sort of progressively less exotic. And there were times when people had, uh, when there were very disjoint networks of, you know, oh, I can, you know, I can get onto BitNet so I can contact you and things. Um, and then it all sort of became the, the sort of the global email um, uh, network, um, complete with all of its uh, strange protocols like the SMTP protocol. Um, what's that? Simple mail transfer protocol, which is the, the main one that's used between mail servers that has this charming uh, thing where the mail servers connect and they they send one of them says to the other in, you know, in, as its connection message, something like, pleased to meet you. Um, and that's being transmitted, you know, billions of times a day around the world. Um, but that's, uh, yeah, that's a little bit of a sketch of some of that history. Um, sorry, that was a little bit um, uh, dis disorganized there, my apologies. Um, just remembering all sorts of different things. Uh, there's a question here from many asking, what were the early days of Wolfram Alpha like? Well, let's see. You know, when I was a kid, I was interested in kind of collecting information and I was sort of uh, thinking about computers and things. And I was like, I want to collect all this information and somehow organize it to be useful. I didn't really get the idea of having one automatically be able to retrieve the information by computer. But by about 19, when I started developing SMP, which was a forerunner of Wolfram language, I started developing that in 1979. And I kind of had this idea of encoding things like mathematical knowledge in uh, this computational system. And I was interested in encoding other kinds of knowledge in the computational system as well. And I had thought at the time that the only way that you would be able to like answer questions about the world would be to have sort of a brain-like AI doing it. And so I was interested, this is my 1980 or so, I got interested in, well, how would you make a brain-like AI? And I was interested in things like neural nets and figuring out, you know, how would you make sort of, uh, in, in, in the language that I built with SMP, which is now sort of in a much evolved form in Wolfram language, one of the key ideas is this notion of transformations for symbolic expressions. You have a symbolic expression that represents something like a mathematical formula, and you then make transformations for that. And the way the transformations are specified is by giving patterns, which in Wolfram language are blanks, underscores, the, uh, sort of the key elements of patterns. And you might say, you know, F of X underscore, comma, underscore, colon equals whatever, and that says, you know, transform anything F of something which is named X and anything else, transform that in this way. So that was a notion of kind of patterns that were very precisely specified. Um, for Patterns for symbolic expressions where you're saying this subtree of the symbolic expression can be anything you want. A little bit like a generalization to trees of regular expressions for strings where you can say this can be any sequence of characters and so on. But that was the kind of my idea for patterns, which has been an idea that's been a pretty good idea. It's, you know, we're at, uh, you know, 40, 40 something years and counting. And that idea is a very powerful idea that has been a foundation for pretty much the whole structure of the symbolic language that we built in, uh, in SMP and in Wolfram language now. So very, very powerful idea. But back in 1980 or so, I was interested in sort of fuzzifying that kind of pattern matching and making it so that one could, for example, do things like say, there are these words and they kind of mean the same thing as these other words and they both kind of match the same pattern. And that got me into thinking a lot about neural nets. And I certainly understood the idea of attractors where you're saying there's a whole bunch of images and they all correspond to this one thing that's either a cat or a dog. And this idea that you would evolve from the initial sort of presented image down to the sort of canonical uh, sort of cat point or the canonical dog point. I didn't understand that. Um, I, I worked a bit on neural nets, but I never managed to make them do anything interesting. The neural nets I was dealing with were really tiny and, and much more precisely trained and not as sort of heuristically and, and, uh, and iteratively trained as modern deep learning neural nets have, have been. But so that was kind of my, my first idea was if you want to make a general question answering, general know about the world kind of system, you're gonna to have to make it brain-like. And so I tried to figure out how to make a brain-like AI type thing, and that turned out to be pretty hard. So 
I, I kind of returned to that question a bunch of times. But then in the 1990s, when I was working on my big book, A New Kind of Science, one of the things that came out there was this thing called the principle of computational equivalence, which was this idea that if you look at different kinds of computational systems with different kinds of rules, that above some extremely low threshold, all these different kinds of systems are ultimately equivalent in their computational capabilities. And so one of the implications of that was the idea that there's no sort of bright line between the intelligent and the merely computational. And so back um, in, uh, 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 back in, um, uh, in 2002, when I finished that book, I kind of, you know, as I was sort of thinking about things, I kind of no longer had the excuse that, oh, we're going to have to invent this brain-like AI. If we were going to do this computational knowledge thing, it had the potential to be sort of a, a pure play computational idea. So that was something that I sort of was starting to think about again um, after <clears throat> the book came out and I sort of recovered from the, uh, well, the 10 years that I spent working on the book and the couple of years that I spent kind of telling the world about that book. And actually, um, uh, one of my kids who must have been at that point, ooh, six, seven years old, something like that, uh, now a very uh, computationally sophisticated individual, but at the time, he was just starting to learn kind of orphan language stuff and was saying, why can't I just type sort of things in in pure plain English? And it's like, I'm like, well, because it's really hard to make that work. And he's like, but look, there are only a limited number of ways you can say this. Uh, I don't completely believe that, but maybe. So that was another kind of impetus to think about kind of, is there a way to take kind of uh, uh, something like Wolfram language or then in Mathematica um, and, uh, uh, and sort of represent that, you know, access that using, using plain language. And so between these different pieces, we kind of started in maybe 2004 uh, to sort of explore what would it take to have a essentially document documentationless access to uh, being able to computationally answer questions. By documentationless, I mean you just type what you think you should type. Nobody has to tell you a structured way to type it. And, and that kind of sort of merged with the thing that I'd long been also interested in of sort of taking in Wolfram language. And uh, we had a certain amount of, of sort of, we obviously had a lot of mathematical and algorithmic knowledge of, you know, here's how to do all these kinds of integrals. Here's how this works. Here's how that works. And we had a limited amount of kind of just structural fact, fact, fact type knowledge. Um, but I kind of got interested in, in could we make uh, sort of a more systematic effort of uh, sort of representing systematic knowledge in the world. And one of the questions was, was, how much systematic knowledge is there in the world? Can you organize it, collect it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And at first it seemed quite daunting, but I was, you know, I had been a, a serious user of reference knowledge for, you know, practically my whole life. And so I had some idea of what sort of what existed out there, you know, when you wanted to find reference information about this or that, what would you find out there? And actually back in, must have been, I don't know, 2005, 2006, um, I remember taking the team that we'd assembled to start working on what would become Wolfram Alpha um, to, um, to take that, um, that team around to kind of get a, a, a sense of how much we had to actually encode in the system. And so we went to a big reference library at, at University of Illinois, actually, um, at, um, uh, to, um, uh, uh, to sort of get a sense of, of what is there that needs to be encoded computationally. It's a big room and it kind of looks a bit daunting because it's full of books, but you realize there's not that many different things here. And I remember that um, I was really pushing for all sorts of different kinds of material. I think we went to an engineering library um, and I was saying, we really need, uh, for example, phase diagrams of materials, just one of, you know, we're making a big list of different kinds of things we need. And I was like, we really need this. Look, there are all these books about this stuff. And I pull one off the shelf and a giant cloud of dust sort of emerges. 
And it's like, there was a lot of dust collected on this book. Nobody's looked at this book for many years. You know, maybe it's not such an important priority after all. But anyway, that, that, was, um, that was kind of that, um, uh, that side of it. Then, you know, in the, in the very early days, uh, sort of one branch of this, we were co- going to call it calculate as because, you know, we really were emphasizing doing calculations and then came in this sort of big idea of sort of computational knowledge about the world and entities and symbolic representation of those kinds of things. Actually, we released the first versions of that in Wolfram Language before, before Wolfram Alpha came out. One of the challenges with Wolfram Alpha was until it really worked quite well, it wasn't going to be at all convincing. It wasn't going to be at all clear what you would do with it because it's like, well, it does these questions, but it doesn't do these other questions. How do I know which questions it does? Sort of the goal was a documentationless system. We just walk up to it and it will usually be able to do something useful. And I think that was something that actually I have to say in terms of sort of management organization, that was a, a, a tra- kind of a tricky thing because we had, um, uh, you know, my management team really didn't know what the point of this whole project was. And I, I have to say, I, I kind of ended up, and this is what you get to do in, in, in private companies like ours, we, I, I, I kind of sort of hid the project for quite a while um, as, uh, uh, as something that um, uh, wouldn't really engage with people saying, no, no, there's a waste of time, there's a waste of time. I preferred for people just not to sort of have an opinion about it until it was ready. And when it was ready and I was able to demo it, people were uh, were within half an hour pretty excited about it. Um, and uh, uh, but that was some, um, uh, you know, there, there was definitely a, a a something of a threshold effect of when the thing was to the point where sort of the typical question you might ask, it would actually be able to to make an answer to or not. We really didn't know what people would ask. We didn't know what expectations people would have about what was possible, how much idea people would have of what was an askable, answerable question in the modern world. I mean, I, I could tell many stories about sort of the dynamics of the introduction of Wolfram Alpha. Um, you know, it was it was a big high wire act in terms of actual server deployments and um, actually setting things up. I, one of the things, um, I'll tell a couple of stories here. Um, one was about Oh, maybe two, three weeks before Wolfram Alpha came out in, in May of, of 2009, um, I was at some event and I run into uh, Marvin Minsky, who's somebody I'd known for many years, who was sort of a, a pioneer of, of AI kinds of, of thinking and so on. And so I, I say to Marvin, hey, I've, we've got this thing and you know it's sort of an interesting system and it does question answering. And in the kind of world of artificial intelligence, people have been talking about question answering for years. I remember actually maybe a year or two before Wolf Malfa came out, I remember going to some event, I think it was at MIT, where there was some group that was doing question answering. And it was like, like you know, they had a question answering system. And I, that's cool. Let me try it out. And it's like, it was absolutely hopeless. It knew nothing. I mean, it was, it was and I don't, I don't actually even know completely what the point of it was supposed to be. Um, but people had sort of had this idea of doing question answering for a long time, but they just hadn't had, you know, they hadn't really been able to make a system that that reached the threshold of being useful. And uh, in addition, people had had sort of the idea of doing, let's understand natural language with a machine. And, and one of the key things, which I only realized after the fact, that made it possible for us to do that successfully when it hadn't been possible before, is in the past people had said, let's abstractly try and understand natural language. Well, what does that mean? You know, the computer puts a light on, says, I understand. Okay, that's hard to to analyze. But with Wolfram language, we had the symbolic representation of computational ideas, and we have a target. So, you know, we're turning English or Spanish or Japanese or whatever it is into uh, that symbolic language. We have a definite target, and that's why we were able to be successful at doing natural language understanding when people hadn't been. But back to my story with, with Marvin Minsky. So, you know, Marvin had seen many attempts at question answering systems over the years. And, uh, you know, Marvin was always talking about all kinds of wild things. Like, I can't remember what the wild thing that he was talking about before I was talking about Wolf Malfo was. But um, anyway, so I say, you know, that. Um, 
uh, it's some, uh, you know, uh, we've done this thing. And so I say, do you want to try it out? So, um, uh, you know, it's like, oh, okay, fine, and whatever. And, and you know, then it's changing the subject back again. And I said, no, 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 you should actually try typing some things here. And so, so then starts off typing things. And then there's this moment where he says, oh, my God, it actually works. Which, you know, because he'd seen many question answering systems before that just had never worked. And we finally had something that actually worked. And I think it was a very, it was very interesting for sort of the dynamics of, of the AI community, which was at that time very small. The AI community had really been beaten down by many, many, many failures, many things that hadn't worked out. Um, and I think Wolf Malfa, I didn't really present it terribly much as an AI thing because people hadn't really paid it much attention to AI at the time. But it was something that, in a sense, provided a success in this general idea of AI um, in a way that was very different from the way I'd sort of imagined of, you know, make a brain-like thing. You know, Wolf Malfa is just an engineering system, so to speak. It has a bunch of clever ideas in it, but it is ultimately just an engineering system. It is merely computational, and it, it, does, it does those kinds of things. I remember when we were actually going to launch Wolf Malfa, um, one of the big issues was we had no idea what the traffic would be. And so we had a certain number of servers. We had, a, 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 I think we already had multiple colos that we'd set up um, with servers in them. And um, we just didn't have any idea what the traffic would be. And so I talked to a couple of, of people who had tried to stand up uh, services. Um, uh, one was kind of a, um, uh, one was a search engine and one was a um, kind of knowledge-y, question -y type system. And they both had had utter disasters. They they had got their systems up, and then you know they'd been announced uh, to the world, and people have started using them, and the systems have both fallen over. So I was I was like I need to talk to the people who did these systems. Um, one was called Cool, and one was called True Knowledge, and they were very helpful. And uh, you know one of them said you know our logging system just got completely backlogged and blew up, and the other one I forget what happened to them. They had some other some other horror that was unexpected um, based on traffic volume. So we were very aware of this and we didn't know how much traffic we would expect, how many queries per second to expect. Um, and we also were, um, uh, we started doing tests, but we also borrowed a sort of a supercomputer uh, worth of, of, um, uh, of, of machines as sort of an overflow for our main, um, uh, our main sort of uh, uh, system. And uh, we also then sort of did this thing of, oh, we're going to launch it on a Friday night, but its official launch is going to be Monday morning. And we're going to get sort of a pre-launch on the Friday night when hopefully there won't be as many people around and we'll get to see what happens. We also decided that um, uh, we would, um, actually, no, maybe it was a Saturday we were going to launch on. Um, we uh, We also decided that um, uh, you know, what the heck, let's make an event out of the launch. And if something, if the whole thing falls over and crashes and burns, let's at least make that something that people can kind of see what happened. So we decided um, uh, to do, to live stream it. And this was a time when um, there was, uh, live streaming was sort of a very new thing. There was this chap I uh, knew named Justin Can, who had a thing called justin.tv, which eventually turned into Twitch. Um, but uh, anyway, um, contacted Justin and we kind of got set up to be able to do essentially a live streamed uh, version of the launch of Wolf Malfa back in 2009. Um, and uh, so we, um, that was sort of the, the thing where, where we decided we, uh, among other things that sort of stimulated us to build out this, uh, nice kind of mission control setup with lots of good monitoring and so on. And actually I have to say, we, we used a lot of that monitoring for, uh, I think we still use some of that monitoring even today and the effort to build it out so that it was sort of good and made for TV, so to speak, turned out to be a really good idea just in terms of our internal use of those monitoring technologies and so on. But in any case, we, we, uh, we then got to the point where we could actually launch the, launch the thing. It had many disasters right up to the very last minute. 
Um, you know, I, I kind of thought it was all going to be plain sailing and it's just like press a button and we're live and it's all good and we see the traffic coming in and we, we see what happens. Uh, one of the more exotic things that happened was that uh, the day we were going to do this, there was uh, we, you know, our main colo. Yeah, we, we had multi, we had three colos, I think, at that time. Our main colo was in central Illinois. And uh, uh, there we are. And there's a tornado watch. And so it seems like, uh, you know, everything may may sort of uh, uh, get get destroyed because there's a tornado heading right for our location. But it it uh, it went away. It didn't uh, was like an hour before we were due to launch, I think, that that happened. Um, so uh, when we actually launched, traffic started coming in. We started seeing queries. We started seeing all kinds of uh, exotic things happening, all kinds of expectations people had. Mostly we did okay. Mostly we, we, we seemed to satisfy expectations, although there were some pretty funny things that happened. I mean, one thing that I, sort of a memorable thing was um, it was a question of what would be the, you know, if something went wrong, uh, you know, how would we indicate that? And so we had some quickly designed kind of um, uh, HAL uh, to, from 2001, like I type image, and we thought just for fun, we would put up something that says, you know, I'm sorry, I can't do that, Dave, which is, you know, a line from the from the movie um, uh, from from its AI computer, so to speak. Um, and uh, OK, this is all fine until somebody uh, is trying to use the system and it uh, and they do something which it can't do. And it comes back with a message. I'm sorry, I can't do that, Dave. And it so happened that the person who who. Uh, who asked the question happened to be called Dave. And so they were both sort of uh, uh, confused and um, uh, and surprised and so on. And so we got kind of an interesting message from them. But that was kind of the very, very early uh, moments of, of, of Wolf Malfa. And, and I have to say that the people's expectations about the system were, um, were mostly yeah not we you know we managed to communicate I think reasonably well what the expectations were the media did not do us a great favor because they were like oh it's a search engine it's you know it's a Google competitor it's whatever now that may have made more people pay attention to to it in the first place but it certainly confused what the thing actually is you know it's a computational knowledge engine that answers questions by computing things it's not searching the web for a bunch of places to link you to a different objective um so you know i think that caused some confusion but i have to say that that you know we uh often alpha's use kind of grew pretty rapidly and was very kind of driven by word of mouth and has continued to be that way um and sort of this use case of things like uh, uh, doing, um, you know, students doing solving math, chemistry, whatever problems on it, was sort of a, a thing that developed very organically. I mean, we we made this effort. I think it was in the fall of two thousand nine. Um, we had this concept of what we called homework day, which was going to be a a kind of uh, you know see how to do your homework on a machine type thing. I have to say, in the end, it was a poorly conceived kind of concept um and uh it wasn't clear uh, it, it 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 was it was it was a bit muddled um but it had some it had some kind of nice material that got produced for it um but uh that was that was kind of one of the things but I, it didn't really have any significant effect i mean i would say when when wolf Malfa was young and there was some you know media thing that came out about it you'd see that blip in the traffic you'd see a blip after a while, after just a month or so, you know, the, the overall traffic had grown to the point where, you know, a story in the New York Times or whatever it was really would barely register in the um, in, in the actual traffic volumes that you would see. All right, let's see. Um, gosh, so many questions. Um, oh, my. Uh, hmm, a lot of interesting questions here. My gosh. Okay. Golagaz says, 
I see many papers from the 1940s, even 1930s in uh, physics journals that are typeset very nicely. How did they do this without things like LaTeX? Oh my, they used uh, phototypesetting machines and there was, uh, so <coughs> back in very early days, right in the, in the what, 1400s or something, people had invented movable type, which meant you would have just individual letters, A's and B's and things in, in cases, you know, you would have the lower case of the uncapital letters and the upper case of the capital letters, and you would pick out these letters, just individual letters out of lead, and you would assemble them in a, in a, in a little tray, and then you would print from that. And when I was a kid, I, I did some of that. Um, you know, those, those devices still existed at that time. But by the 1930s or so, 1940s maybe, there were phototypesetting machines where you would uh, compose the, um, uh, where you would have some specification language, you have some way of typing in um, the uh, a specification of what was supposed to be typeset, and it was made photographically, and it was etched onto a plate, and then that plate was used for printing. Now, when that happened, people started having to do math typesetting, as well as just regular text and so on. And so there, there started to be essentially languages on these phototypesetting machines for specifying um, the uh, how to represent math. And one of the things that was, was interesting was that the people who were doing phototypesetting, they didn't know math from anything. They were just like, it looks like this. You know, I have a manuscript that is, you know, whereas a handwritten formula or maybe a typed on a typewriter formula with a little bit of handwritten stuff added in. And I want to make that something that I can put in the phototypesetting machine. And so there are all these names. Like I remember one of them is uh, uh, things called fences, which are the names for absolute value signs, vertical bars. Um, I, I think are called fences in the um, in sort of phototypesetting lingo. And there are these names that are very kind of whimsical appearance-based names for all these all these constructs that are used in mathematics. But there started to be languages for representing phototype setting um, that included mathematical stuff that was usually called penalty copy, I think, because it was kind of like you would type, you know, you're typing a newspaper column or something, and that was really fast to type, and you could enter it in the phototype setting machine, and it would be all good. But when it came to a piece of math, that was a big pain, and it would take lots of effort to kind of, you know, move things around and so on. So there were languages, oh gosh, what were their names? Ooh, ooh what were their names? Um, there were languages used by specialist phototypesetting people, uh, kind of um, tradespeople who did phototypesetting that were used to, to typeset mathematics. And that was a, a, a technology that existed certainly by 1930s and 1940s that absolutely existed. Um, and... Uh, I would think, well, I mean, there are books, I mean, I have books from the 1600s that have some mathematics in them. And I would think that was done by taking the pieces of lead type. And if you wanted to have a superscript, you would get a smaller piece of lead type and you would stuff another piece of lead in there to get that superscript held in place um, on, the, on the page. And yeah, you certainly see that, that kind of thing in, you know, I think that those were very, I mean, in um, uh, you know, that, that was one technology. Then there were things like woodcuts where you would explicitly make, kind of carve things out that way. I mean, there are uh, uh, certainly, well, in Newton's Principia, 1687, there was quite a bit of mathematical notation that was um, uh, in the earlier books as well. So I think that was done by literally just taking pieces of lead type and moving them around. I mean, occasionally, there were exotic things that would happen where you would have to actually make a new piece of lead type. There's a famous story that Bertrand Russell, when he was uh, doing the Whitehead Russell Principia Mathematica book in 1910, that was sort of a, an early mathematical logic, uh, um, impressive show-off piece of mathematical logic, I would say, um, that um, he had invented some new symbolism and um, he needed to get that typeset. And the Cambridge University Press was very, you know, no, no, we're not going to do that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Russell had somebody just make the lead type 
and apparently, uh, so the story goes, uh, you know, Russell was to be seen with a wheelbarrow, kind of wheeling the type to the press um, so that they could typeset pieces of the Pekinpeh Mathematica book in, in 1910. So uh, then what happened, so there were these specialist phototypesetting systems that were really used only by the professional phototypesetters. When computers started to be able to do phototypesetting, and really the early versions of that were things like TROF, the typesetting system in Unix that was developed at Bell Labs um, by, oh my gosh. Um, I think Brian Cunningham ended up being part of that, but I forget there was a different person who was, who was I think, the originator of that. But TROF kind of imitated uh, sort of some of that early, um, uh, some of those earlier sort of by hand phototypesetting things. And, and TROF's target device was a phototypesetting machine. So I think it, it eventually had to sort of plug into, it had to drive a phototypesetting machine using its native language. Now into the middle of all of this, uh, Don Knuth developed tech because he wanted to typeset his own books. And, uh, and then that, um, and it has this whole DVI mechanism, which I guess is a thing that's sort of for compatibility with phototypesetters. And then after all of that came the PostScript language, PostScript page description language, um, which sort of was the, the thing that really launched the, um, the desktop publishing uh, revolution with the you know, PostScript being built into laser writers and so on. And, and that, was, that was kind of how that developed. But the ability to do some kind of typesetting math was certainly existed much, much earlier. I mean, when I was, uh, you know, first writing physics papers in the 1970s, um, you know, I would type them on a typewriter and I would hand write the alphas and lambdas and things like that. And I would, uh, you know, the things like the bars and so on, I would, I would just move the, the typewriter, uh, car you know, um, uh, roller so that, you know, you put the bar in the right place and, and things like this. And it was sort of a mixture of handwritten stuff and so on. One of the innovations at that time was the IBM Selectric typewriter, which had these golf balls where you would have, uh, uh, you know, you have the keyboard and the keyboard would say, you know, at the position of the W or something that would correspond to, uh, you know, put the character that corresponds to that location on this golf ball like thing that was being turned around that would specify what was actually printed based on you typing a W. So the typical thing that you would do then was you would have a golf ball that corresponded to, let's say, the Greek alphabet, and you would literally, you know, flip out, you know, you would, you would pull this little lever, you would pull out the golf ball that um, was for the ordinary English character set, you would put in the one for the Greek character set, then you would type, you know, I think a, a Q was a gamma, if I remember correctly, um, and an A was an alpha and so on, you would type those things. And, and often as a practical matter, you would, you would type things, but you would leave spaces for the Greek letters. And then you would go back and go to the beginning of the line again and put in a different golf ball and, and type those characters and so on. And that was a technology when, when um, let's see, my first papers, for example, I would uh, hand write the, um, oh, that was probably 1975-ish. I would hand write all the all the formulas, uh, you know, after I typed what I could type, I would handwrite the rest. By um, uh, by 1978, maybe even 77. Yeah, when I was first in the U.S., um, people had these IBM Selectric typewriters. Maybe that was an American phenomenon. Maybe they didn't have that in the U.K. I can't remember. Um, and uh, and one was doing this thing about swapping out golf balls and things. I think I was uh, most people would leave it to the secretary to um, uh, you know to type the papers. I I tended to be uh, uh, sometimes something of a do-it-yourselfer, um, even if um, a very fine um, a person who would type papers, um, a woman named he Helen Tuck, who was the assistant to actually Dick Feynman and, and Murray Gell-Mann, and also to the theoretical physics group in general at Caltech. And I remember one of my moments with them uh, there was I'd written this paper uh, that used actually computer, um, uh, you know, used a whole bunch of computer calculations to calculate all of these exotic formulas and things. And, uh, but, but the, the final paper, I'd sort of handwritten out a bunch of formulas and I gave it to Helen and, uh, you know, she was going to type it and she types the thing and uh, you know, it comes back 
And every time I had written a nine, she typed it as a G. And I said, why did you do that? She said, papers never have nines in them, you know, because nobody had ever had computers to calculate all these exotic formulas. So the probability of having, you know, actually the, the way numbers work with Benford's law and so on, the chance at least that the initial digits are ones is much higher than the chance the initial digit is a nine. But, you know, it was very rare for a paper to be full of, of uh, formulas that had nines in them. So, so she typed them all as Gs. Uh, it was a, a reasonable AI type inference that just turned out to be wrong because the prior was uh, was wrong because I was using computers to calculate uh, formulas which one hadn't seen before that time. Let's see. Um, well, there are questions here. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. All right, there's a question here about perpetual motion machines. Um, Anon says, it's been said that a real perpetual motion machine cannot exist. Do you agree or do you think we can get there? We just don't know how yet. You know, it so happens that I've been studying thermodynamics recently, a subject that I started studying 50 years ago when I was like 12 years old or something. And um, I finally am trying to write down a, a clear understanding because it dovetails with a lot of things we've done in our physics project, looking at the structure of space-time and quantum mechanics and things like this. So just to give a little bit of history. So, you know, steam engines were a big thing in the 1700s, late 1700s, and people like James Watt and so on were, were um, figuring out how do you make a more efficient steam engine? How do you take heat in the steam engine and turn it into mechanical work of turning wheels around to make a train go forward or, or to, you know, move, you know, to pump water out of a mine or something like this. So there's a great interest in how do you go from heat to mechanical work and how efficient can you make that? And a lot of practical innovations were made in different, you know, Newcomen engines, you know, other people, all these different kinds of ways to, um, to make efficient steam engines and turn essentially the heat of steam that was made by burning coal typically into mechanical work. Okay, so then in the 1820s, a chap called Sadi Carnot came along. He was a, a kind of a, he come from the sort of military political uh, family in France that was at sometimes in favor, at sometimes out of favor. But um, he was, he got interested in the question of just how efficient can you make a, an engine, a steam engine, a heat engine. Um, and so he tried to work that out and he came up with a, a theory for that, um, that was a sort of theoretical idea of what a, a, an idealized machine might be like. It was interesting, and I, and I still need to read more of what he wrote, because I think it was one of the first places where the concept of an abstracted machine really arose. I mean, that comes in later in things like Turing machine as an abstracted machine for doing computation, but this was an abstracted machine for turning heat into mechanical work. And he concluded things about the efficiency of that and the idea that you always had to have a hot part and a cold part, and that sort of you got, uh, you got the mechanical work by sort of the interplay of the hot part and the cold part. Well, uh, Carnot, at the time, there was a question of what is heat? And people didn't know what heat was. They thought it was a substance called phlogiston that was a, a fluid-like thing that would sort of suffuse substances and you could like have heat as a disembodied kind of, uh, kind of material. Now, actually people even in the 1600s had uh, sort of thought that gases might be atoms, you know, discrete things bouncing around. Um, they had, uh, well, Newton had had particular ideas about that, but they were very gravity-based. And, and people sort of thought that, for example, in a gas, the reason that there was pressure of a gas had to do with the fact that the molecules, if there were molecules, were repelling each other in, through some force a bit like gravity. In, in truth, it is not repulsion. It's just these molecules are bouncing around and colliding off each other. And it's just the mere momentum of those molecules hitting the walls that causes pressure. But at the time, it was very much thought to be, you know, if it was molecules, it was molecules with repulsive forces in them. So, but by the early 1800s, the sort of phlogiston idea of the substance that is like heat 
that represents heat was definitely in the ascendant. And Carnot was very much in that tradition, but nevertheless, he worked out these things about the efficiency of heat engines and so on, and, and wrote uh, this book called On the Motive Power of Heat um, that talked about these kinds of things and, and uh, gave some formulas and so on. His work was somewhat lost, but then there started to be other people who were interested in um, uh, sort of the relationship between heat and mechanical work and so on. And, and, and this question still kicked around, what was heat? Important experiment was done by um, James Prescott Jewell, who um, uh, noticed that when you sort of ground a, a, a cannon or something, that the, the, the friction was going to generate heat. The mechanical work turned into heat. And, and people were sort of noticing that there was sort of this question of, was heat a form of energy? What was energy? And was it interconvertible in some way with energy. And, and people were very confused because, well, what became clear by, by about 1850, by the 1850s, was that heat could be thought of as a type of energy and that there was a notion of interconvertibility of heat energy with mechanical energy. And that there was this, this one kind of thing called en that you could call energy that was a conserved quantity where the total amount of energy was conserved, but it could be in these different forms. And that turned into the first law of thermodynamics, formulated around 1860-ish, that said uh, heat is a form of energy, and you can kind of you can kind of count energy from kinetic energy, from mechanical energy, from from uh, heat energy, and these are all sort of the total amount of energy is conserved. You can set it up that way. Okay, so then the big question was, well, why you know? In principle, heat and mechanical work were both energy. Why couldn't you go from heat energy to mechanical work energy and just get sort of why wasn't it easy to go from heat to mechanical work? That you had to have these things like you had to have a hot part and a cold part, and it was the flow of heat from one to the other that would generate mechanical work. You couldn't just go from a lump of heat to mechanical work. And people really wanted to do that. They want to just take heat and make mechanical work. So one thing that happened, uh, and then what, what came out was the second law of thermodynamics, which essentially said that there, it wasn't possible to go, you could go from mechanical work to heat, but you couldn't go just back directly from, uh, from heat to mechanical work. You couldn't, you couldn't do that. So what arose was this idea of perpetual motion machines, perpetual motion machine of the first kind and perpetual motion machine of the second kind, a perpetual motion machine of, a, of the first kind is one that gets energy from nothing, that just that breaks the law of conservation of energy and just generates energy when there wasn't any energy there before. A perpetual motion machine of the second kind is one which breaks the second law of thermodynamics and goes back from the energy in the form of heat to energy of the form of mechanical work, when the second law says you can go from one to the other, but not, not back, so to speak. So. What happened, the perpetual motion machine of the second kind, people have been claiming you can make them forever and ever and ever. Um, what does it really, what's really involved? Well, the problem is that in, we now know that heat is a kind of motion. It's the microscopic motion of molecules and so on. Um, and the, the fact that we sort of don't naturally go back from heat to mechanical work is the heat is all randomized and you'd have to line all those molecules up and get them all to go sort of in the same direction, which is what you can do. If you have a hot a reservoir and a cold reservoir, they sort of all flow from one to the other. Um, and, and that's what, um, uh, and, and you need that some sort of organizing, print organizing structure to sort of line up all that randomness that represents heat. So by the way, the second law of thermodynamics was stated in various ways, but one way of stating it is, heat doesn't spontaneously flow from a colder body to a hotter body. Uh, you, you get, you know, you, a hotter thing can make a colder thing hotter, but not the other way around. That's one statement. Another statement is basically that, that perpetual motion machines of the second kind don't exist, that it's not possible to just go take a lump of heat and generate mechanical work from it. Okay, so what's really involved in this? It, it, this is a subtle thing. I've been writing about it recently. Hopefully I'll get this finished in the next, not too very long. Um, but uh, uh, this question of, you know, you've got 
heat. So you've got these random motions. Well, are they really random? What do we mean by random? They came from some, you know, from some initial condition, maybe a very organized initial condition, but by virtue of some process, they're all randomized. That process is, a, is what I view as a computational process. It's a computationally irreducible process. It's a process where you're running this computation and much like things like my rule 30 cellular automaton, for example, where you just have a simple rule. And from that simple rule, just starting off from let's say one black cell, you make this very complicated pattern. That's what's happening in thermodynamic behavior. That's what's happening when systematic mechanical work, grinding the cannon you know, barrel or something, turns into pure heat of kind of randomized, um, uh, randomized elements. Um, and I think uh, that this idea that what you get is randomized is, um, is a, uh, you know, what exactly do we mean by randomized? It's randomized with respect to the ways that we look at the motion of molecules, but it may not be truly, it's not truly randomized because you can get it in a very definite way with definite rules. So actually back in the 1860s, when the second law of thermodynamics was first coming into existence, James Clerk Maxwell, I think I've talked about him before, I'm very impressed with him. And I, as I learn more about him, I, I just would really have liked to have met him. Uh, but, you know, he died a, a solid, um, uh, what was it, 80 years before I was born, something like that. Um, the, uh, so, but in any case, James Clerk Maxwell, um, in his book on the theory of heat, for example, um, uh, has a very nice description of what he calls a Maxwell's demon that is a microscopic critter that breaks the second law of thermodynamics. It's a little critter that has a, you know, has a, 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 a wall with a door in it, for example, and the critter opens the door when there's a, a fast going molecule and doesn't when there's a slow going molecule or whatever, and basically is able to sort the molecules just by being down there at the molecular scale and sort of uh, uh, analyzing what's going on. And so if you could have a Maxwell's demon, you would break the second law of thermodynamics. If you could have a Maxwell's demon, you would be able to uh, you know, go in and sort the molecules and you would be able to take that randomized energy that is heat and your demon could de-randomize that, that, uh, that energy. Now, does that work? Well, people have been arguing about that for a long time, and they've had all kinds of different reasons why the demon doesn't work. Oh, the demon uses needs to use a flashlight to look at the molecules, and the flashlight will take energy. Oh, the demon needs to have a memory, and, and by erasing data in its memory, it necessarily has to expend, uh, generate heat. Variety of different kinds of, of things. I think what's true is, uh, that, oh, uh, by the way, I should say, people continue to propose Maxwell's demon-like devices, even in the last few weeks. There are papers in sort of top physics journals talking about these kinds of things. Most of the time these days, they're electronic devices where you have effectively noise that's coming in and you have an electronic signal processor that's cleaning up that noise to make something systematic. Um, by the way, like my friend Dick Feynman, had a version of this with a ratchet and pawl, where, where you would say the random noise would make a ratchet that always went in one direction. And so even though there's random noise, you would be systematically turning this wheel in one direction. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, Max Planck had had a, a version of the second law of thermodynamics, which said, it can't be that the sole result of heat is to move some weight up and down, so to speak. Um, so. Uh, that had been, um, uh, so, so Dick Feynman had a version of this and he said, oh, it doesn't work because eventually the ratchet and pawl heat up and they stop working and so on. But I think what's really true about this is it depends what you assume about the, the construction of the Maxwell's demon. If you assume the Maxwell demon can be made of anything, then, well, you can make it work. You can have some system that's made of electronics and so on, and it's interacting with gas molecules and it can rectify the signal and sort of de-randomize the gas molecules. Now, uh, you know, and if, but on the other hand, if you say, 
the Maxwell's demon is sort of made of the same stuff as the system you're looking at, then it's a different story. And then essentially it's a story of computational irreducibility that you can't sort of uh, detect, you can't jump over the randomness to figure out what's going to happen. The way you make a winning Maxwell's demon is you make something that can uh, that can kind of predict what the gas molecules are going to do before they do it, be ready for it, and then sort of leverage that prediction. By the uh, and and for that from that you could make a perpetual motion machine of the second kind if you could do that. The problem is that in practice there's computational irreducibility. And so you can't make those kinds of predictions with a computational device, or in, or in particular, with a computational device that interfaces to sort of observers like us, you can't make such a thing. Now, actually, what was it, a couple of years ago now, uh, just for fun, I was, I was thinking about this in the context of space-time, where in our models of space as a giant network, one has very much the same kind of thing going on as happens with molecules in a gas. You know, the structure of space, as we perceive it, is made from these microscopic networks in much the same way that the sort of structure of a fluid or a gas is made from microscopic motions of molecules. And so that raises the question of, is there a sort of Maxwell's demon for space-time? And if so, what does it do? And what realizes, well, yes, there is. And the analog of a Maxwell's demon for space-time is the ability to go faster than the speed of light. Um, because in the, um, uh, in the whole structure of space-time, this sort of randomized jumping around is what makes space have the kind of structure that we experience it to have. And that makes uh, sort of a, a flash of light that goes off here will expand in, in space time in a cone, in a light cone. And that light cone will, will sort of extend to a certain point and that maximum extent corresponds to the speed of light. But the truth is, if you look down at the level of the actual microscopic you know, structure of the network, you would see all sorts of little proboscises coming out of that light cone, all sorts of little places where you got a little bit faster than the light cone. Not actually because anything's going sort of microscopically in the network faster than the speed of light, but because the structure of space is a complicated thing. And its construction, let me give you an analogy. In, in this room, there's a bunch of air molecules. Most air molecules go only a millionth of a meter before they hit another air molecule. And so their directions are continually randomized. So if I were to uh, release some gas right here, it would take a long time for you know many minutes, let's say, for that gas to diffuse to the other side of the room. Because those gas molecules, even though microscopically they're going at roughly the speed of sound, they keep on hitting other gas molecules. Their directions are randomized. They follow this random walk. The aggregate speed at which they go is quite slow. But if you could only pick the right molecule, if you could only you know, bet on the right molecular horse, and every time there's a collision, you say, oh, I want to go on that one. I want to go on that one. I want to go on that one. Well, then you would have a chance to just go at the speed of sound because you would be kind of moving, oh, that one's going in the right direction. OK, now that one's going in the right direction. You're not dealing with this random walk of going in all kinds of different directions. You're always just picking the right molecule to go on and going at the speed of sound. So what would happen is, you know, this question of how fast can you get, can you go as a gas molecule, for example, across this room? The answer is, well, actually, you can go a lot faster than uh, than the standard speed of diffusion. You can go actually at the speed of sound. And so something similar happens in space time, I think. Uh, that you could, if you could surf the right atoms of space, you would be able to go at a speed greater than the local speed of light. But in fact, it's a problem very much like the, the problem of making a perpetual motion machine of the second kind, that you can't, you know, you can't do the computation, let alone having sort of the fingers small enough to reach down to the atoms of space, a tough thing to do, given that everything we have is made of, of atoms of space. But you know, you, you can't do that um, uh, just from a pure computational point of view. You can't figure out which atom of space to bet on, so to speak, to go to the next place. So I think the impossibility of perpetual motion machines of the second kind is, is really a computational statement more than it is anything else. And I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's worth remembering that if we existed 
down at the scale of molecules, there are all kinds of motions that we might care about that may be happening, may easily be happening in lots of different situations. But the motions that we care most about are these very large scale motions that we call mechanical work. And that's because we're big compared to molecules. And so the things we care about are things big compared to molecules. We might have some, it could be the case that somewhere in our biology, there is, you know, somewhere in the kidneys or something or in the lungs, there is some detailed structure that actually doesn't care about the aggregate mechanical work of the gas, but cares about some little tiny eddy in the gas that works this way or that, and that that interacts with some very microscopic, you know, micron-sized uh, feature of, um, of, of sort of the, 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 um, the pieces of the, you know, the end leaves of the lung, of the tree of, of, of tubes in our lungs and so on. So, you know, there are, there are things like that that could happen where what counts as mechanical work might be a little different to a different kind of observer of the gas. And it might be the case that just those little swirls that we at the level of what has been talked about in thermodynamics to date don't care about. But as a, as a sort of the last step in you know, diffusion in the lung or something, we might care about it and it, and, and it might be important. And, and actually because of the development of thermodynamics to date, we really wouldn't know about it yet because that hasn't been a thing that's really been looked at. So, okay, so someone's commenting here, Dr. Mike here is commenting at a quantum scale, there seems to be perpetual motion. Um, uh, and okay, so let's talk about that for just a second here. We should wrap up soon, but um, uh, okay. Uh, well, oh boy, this is a can of worms. So, uh, Mickey, Mike, whatever, is, is certainly right that, um, okay, how does this work in, in, um, at the quantum scale? Nothing is ever completely motionless. There's always something. We don't call it heat. We call it vacuum fluctuations. Uh, now, let me fill in a few things. So the third law of thermodynamics says you can't get to absolute zero. You can't make things, you can't get rid of all heat in a finite number of steps. And essentially, the reason for the third law is this, that heat is all this random motion. To get rid of the heat, you have to get rid of all that random motion. You have to have, kind of have something that blocks this random piece, that random piece, that random piece. And that's a... a, a because of computational irreducibility, that's ultimately not a thing that you can finitely do. You can't sort of block all those different computationally irreducible pieces. But the third law is the story of what it takes to get down to absolute zero, where things, where there is no heat, there's no ordinary classical heat. Okay, in quantum mechanics and in quantum field theory in particular, there is always a zero point fluctuation. And, and roughly the reason for that, you can see it in many different ways, but um, sort of a traditional quantum mechanical way of seeing it is there's this uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics that says you can't, for example, simultaneously measure position and momentum, energy and time. You can't simultaneously measure, uh, well, you basically can't, can't guarantee that there are zero particles in this measurement then as there's an uncertainty in particle number as there is in all these other quantum mechanical kinds of things. And what another way to think of that, what's happening is that in there's no way to just turn off quantum field theory. You're always making particle antiparticle pairs. They pop up and they, and they annihilate again. It might take 10 to the minus 20 seconds. They pop up, they annihilate uh, and so on. And in that's always happening. And so what we say, oh, it's the vacuum, nothing's happening there. You can't switch off the quantum field theory. So there are always these little things that are going on, these little fluctuations that are going on. And so when we perceive things to happen in physics, it was always relative to that vacuum fluctuating vacuum, so to speak. So we're saying, what happened in addition to all those vacuum fluctuations that were going on? But in the pure vacuum, there is this sort of continual kind of... Uh, 
uh, production of particle antiparticle pairs and so on. And, and there are some effects where you can see that. There's one called the Casimir effect, uh, where it works this way. You have two plates, two metal plates, they're just sitting in the vacuum, and they feel a small force of attraction between them. Why is that? The reason is that in this quantum field, there are all these different things that can happen, these particle antiparticle pairs that can be produced. The, the presence of those metal plates restricts the kinds of particle antiparticle pairs that can be produced between the metal plates, but not the ones that can be produced outside the metal plates. Essentially, ones that are too low in energy, where uh, energy is, is a, uh, energy and distance have an uncertainty relation and so on. And if you have too low in energy, you are too delocalized uh, in space, and you sort of can't fit that mode of the particles in between these plates. And so those vacuum fluctuations, those very low frequency, long wavelength vacuum fluctuations can't happen between the plates, but they can happen outside the plates. And so there's a small force um, of the of the vacuum, so to speak, outside the plates. There's more vacuum in some sense outside the plates than inside. So there's a force that pushes them together. Now, that explanation is a bit of a, a put up job because in detail, it isn't in fact the case that every uh, if you'd have different shapes of boxes and things, and you have like a cuboid of, uh, of material, turns out vacuum fluctuations don't actually quite work that way when you work them out with actual quantum field theory. And they have sometimes repulsive forces rather than attractive forces and so on. Actually, back in 1981, I wrote a little paper with a, a chap called Jan Ambjorn about, uh, we called it properties of the vacuum. And we talked about exactly this phenomenon of if you have different shaped boxes, you know, kind of what forces are there from the vacuum. And actually, interestingly enough, um, we worked out what was sort of what happens if you go from this shape of box to that shape of box and so on. And, and you know, noticed a few things about it. A few years go by, I get a letter from a chap called Robert Ford, who was a physicist and science fiction writer, actually. He says, are you sure your calculations are right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're right. He says, well, if your calculations are right, there is a closed cycle, like the Kano cycle, that uh, for heat engines, there's a closed cycle that extracts energy from the vacuum. And, and so he looked at this and he's right, that you know the Casimir effect, this, this vacuum fluctuation effect, you can squidge the box, this shape and that shape, and you can make this closed cycle and you can be just you know, mining energy out of the vacuum. How can this possibly be? How can it possibly work? Well, the one feature of that is that idea even if it didn't make it into science fact, definitely made it into science fiction. And I really am amused. I a bunch of movies which where people are like, we're going to blow it up with, we're going to drive the spaceship with zero point fluctuations. We're going to, uh, you know, have a thing that that uh, is a, a kind of a, a blow everything up with zero point fluctuations and so on, uh, which I think came from that, um, uh, you know, that investigation. In in reality, it doesn't quite work because. In order, what are you going to make the box out of? You make have to make the box out of a material that is essentially completely impermeable to quantum fields, and you just can't do that. If you make a metal box, well, a metal box has you know electrons and it has a crystal lattice, and it it, it restricts certain uh, uh, sort of electromagnetic fields, but it can't shield all electromagnetic fields because it's made of things of a certain size and so on. So in the end, you can't do this with standard material things. Now, I have to say, I was just recently looking at, and actually, as I talk to you guys, I have an idea. Um, I was just recently looking at the thermodynamics of space-time, which has been studied a bit in the case of black holes, but not so much outside of black holes. And you give me the idea that I wonder whether that kind of closed thermodynamic cycle actually works in space-time, and whether there is a similar kind of phenomenon. Now, I, I should say that in our models of physics, the whole idea of vacuum fluctuations uh, is, is, is very much tied into the very structure of space itself. These things where you have sort of this quantum process that's happening, that is the, the rewriting of the structure of space. It's something that's sort of below the level of quantum gravity, even you're, you're seeing the structure of space is knitted together from all these things that you might describe as vacuum fluctuations, all these different kinds of microscopic processes. And so, so you would expect, and, and actually it's a, it's a good exercise. Okay, my, my homework exercise is to figure out whether you can make 
a, uh, a, a machine that will be a perpetual motion machine of the second kind operating on space time. Uh, my guess actually is that you probably can do it, um, but that it probably leverages the, um, it, it probably is based on the expansion of the universe and it probably is essentially uh, sort of what you're doing is in the end, taking energy out of the expansion of the universe. That, you, that you're basically taking what would otherwise be an overall flow of expansion of the universe and you're saying, no, 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 I don't want to use that to just make the universe bigger. I'm going to use that locally to you know, power my car or whatever. Uh, not, that, not that I think that's likely to be practical anytime soon. Um, but anyway, so, so the, um, the story of uh, um, uh, there, are, you know, there are vacuum fluctuations and um, um, the extent to which, uh, well, which, which are kind of like an irreducible form of heat that exists in a sense, heat of that kind is what knits together the structure of space-time and what is underneath everything that we see in the universe. Um, okay, there's one last question here relating to this topic. Uh, um, as a comment about something I've never heard of, the Oxford clock. I don't know what that is. Um, there's a comment here from Aaron, uh, a question here from Aaron. What were people's reactions to Kano's exploration of steam energy mechanics and the development of the Kano cycle? I think people ignored it. I think people didn't understand the point. They ignored it. Um, you know, I think uh, Kano died quite young and um, he was... Uh, you know, I think his father had been quite a, a, a significant sort of military political figure in the Napoleonic period. And I think that um, uh, the, um, 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 uh, you know, as happened to quite a few, it happens throughout history, that, uh, you know, people's work is enmeshed with the sort of local politics of the time. And, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, so, uh, Carnot didn't uh, uh, have the problem that uh, Evariste Galois had in 1830-something. Uh, Evariste Galois had been this sort of precocious math person who invented kind of group theory ideas and is about 20 years old or something, but was also a, a young, hotshot, political, hot political activist and um, anyway, eventually died in a duel, which was sort of a put-up job that was connected to his whole political activism story. Um, and I think Carnot was not himself in that, in that mold around the same time, but I think he, he sort of had family things there. And I think that didn't help his, um, uh, the longevity of his ideas at the time, unfortunately. And subsequently, people like William Thompson, Lord Kelvin, picked them up in the 1860s and beyond. Um, they were, you know, what he did was sort of rediscovered but people were thinking about it separately. I mean, it's sort of an interesting twist of history that um, uh, Kelvin um, talked a lot about, about the second law of thermodynamics and the impossibility of perpetual motion machines. And, um, and then, you know, then we get to 1900-ish and people are asking him, well, what about flying machines? What about heavier than air flight? And I think he was probably thinking, and I need to track down this history more carefully, I think he was probably thinking about his proofs of the impossibility of perpetual motion machines, because he said heavily, heavier than air flight is just not going to be possible. It's going to be sort of impossible. Probably he thought for the same generalized types of reasons that turning heat into mechanical work wasn't going to be possible. So it was sort of an interesting mistake that came out of his work in the second law of thermodynamics. And I, I really need to track down more details about um, how that worked. Uh, and, um, oh, Aaron asks a question that I don't know the answer to. The history of uh, the Fahrenheit scale and ancient representations of temperature um, and non-numerical ones. You know, the idea of temperature as a, a definite thing, which is essentially the content of the zero -th law of thermodynamics, the zero earth law of thermodynamics kind of says there is this notion of equilibrium and there's this one number that characterizes sort of the, the, that characterizes equilibrium and it's just temperature. The idea that there is a notion of temperature is an idea that must have, hmm, 
when did that come into existence? Uh, you know, thermometers were a thing of, I think, the 1700s. Don't think they existed before that time. And people were using, you know, alcohol thermometers, later mercury thermometers, using the expansion of materials as they got hotter because, you know, the reason they expand is because the atoms are bouncing around more and they have an easier time spending more time further away from each other. So that's why materials tend to get bigger when they get hotter. But that's what you do in an in a, a alcohol thermometer or a mercury thermometer. You're, you're seeing how this column of, of fluid gets expands as you heat the thing up. The Fahrenheit scale was derived from, um, uh, you know, it's like, like, let's be useful. Let's have it go from the lowest temperature recorded in this particular city in Germany to the highest temperature recorded in this city in Germany and have that go zero to 100. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, it is, it is convenient in the sense that typical sort of places in uh, sort of the, the heavily populated uh, latitudes are, um, uh, well, I guess there are other heavily populated latitudes, but the traditionally heavily populated latitudes, um, you know, sort of go from roughly zero to 100 in the Fahrenheit scale. Um, but uh, that's something that um, is, uh, um, uh, you know, I, I think, I think, so I think thermometers, once thermometers had come in, people wanted to have these scales of temperature that told you sort of, uh, uh, you know, gave you, a, gave you a sense of how hot something was. Now, the absolute scale of temperature, people like Kelvin, uh, after whom the, the absolute scale of temperature in Kelvin's is, is named, you know, realized that there was an actual minimum, there was an actual zero, that, you know, at, once you knew that temperature was a form of, of, of motion, was the result of motion of molecules, you knew that there was going to be a zero of temperature, a true absolute zero of temperature that corresponded to the motions, not the molecules not moving around, and that's minus 273.16 degrees centigrade, zero kelvins. Now, you know, there are many tricky things about temperature. I'll just, I'll just zoom to a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, in Wolfram Alpha and in Wolfram Language, we have a representation of temperature. And um, we. Uh, what's tricky is temperature differences are not the same as absolute temperatures. And you can end up with a temperature difference of some number of degrees centigrade. And that temperature difference, you can multiply it by things. You can do all kinds of things with it. It's a temperature difference. The, the absolute temperature of such and such a number of degrees the word degrees is put in there to indicate that it's this kind of scale um, that uh, that's a different kind of thing than a temperature difference. You can't really multiply. If you take 100 degrees centigrade and you multiply it by three, that's kind of a meaningless thing to do because the zero isn't, you know, that, that, that thing is just a, you know, the difference of temperature, 50 to 100 degrees centigrade, that's perfectly meaningful. The difference of 50 degrees centigrade is a perfectly meaningful thing. You can multiply and so on, but you can't multiply the, the, the temperature. You can, in Kelvins, because they are on this absolute scale, you can do this multiplication, but you can't for degrees centigrade. So one of the questions is in the notation that people have when they write 50 degrees centigrade, it's like, how do you know whether that's one of these multipliable things that's a temperature difference, or whether it's just the temperature of 50 degrees centigrade on the degree scale, so to speak. And, and so one's needed a notation for this, and there just isn't one, so we invented one. And it's a little thing with a capital delta that that's kind of goes down downstairs with the degree sign upstairs. Uh, there is some people have used sort of put the degree sign after the C or whatever, but that's really obscure looking and, and un not understandable. So we're inventing, we'll be introducing this actually in version 13.2 of uh, Wolfram Language. We'll be introducing this notation for temperature differences of, of degree difference, degree centigrade. It's kind of it's kind of amazing that, you know, that that hasn't been a thing so far, but but now that we're trying to make all these notions of temperature and so on more computable, we do have to have it be a thing. Um, I am wondering whether, uh, you know, in, in ancient times, whether people had a notion, well, they obviously had a notion, it's hot today, it's cold tomorrow. I know, for example, the Babylonians for, for 700 years recorded these astronomical diaries that recorded sort of facts about what was going on. They recorded the positions of planets, they recorded uh, rain, uh, they recorded the level of the river, things they recorded, corn prices, grain prices, things like that. 
Um, but they didn't record temperature. So I, I don't think they had a notion of, um, I, they, they didn't, for whatever reason, that wasn't a, a, a quantity that perhaps they had no way to say it was a hot day today, it was a cold day today, maybe in, maybe in the position of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of ancient Babylon. I don't know. I don't know the temperature the profiles of that part of the world at that time in history. Maybe it didn't change much. I'm not sure. It certainly rained a bunch. I, uh, one knows that from the astronomical diaries. Um, but uh, so, you know, I think this, um, oh, actually, actually, I'm, 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 I'm thinking to myself, I'm realizing something that I've missed here. There is the Central England temperature record, which I believe goes to 1650. So I think that that must have been the time when the first thermometers were around. That's the longest running kind of record when people say, you know, are things getting warmer in the world or not? You can look at the Central England temperature uh, series, and that gives you for one place. Obviously, the environment has changed. It probably might be getting warmer in a city because it's full of, uh, you know, asphalt and so on, and the and the you know, uh, absorbing the sun better. It might have been, you know, who knows what was happening there that that um, that might have changed the temperature. But but that's, I think it goes to 1650, that particular record. So that, that probably gives one, that's probably the longest, um, that probably gives one a, a sense of when thermometers were starting to come in. But but at that time, obviously, people started caring about recording temperatures. But I don't think, I don't think it was a thing in antiquity. I don't think people noticed that. I mean, they, they well, certainly, poof, there are certainly words for hot and cold, for sure. Um, and uh, people, people must have known. Okay, so here's another point. Um, in, uh, in developing sort of the refining of, of metals, um, uh, people like Agricola, for example, uh, you know, who wrote about kind of the um, uh, turning, getting metals out of ore, they certainly knew you had to heat it up and you had to get it to a certain point. I wonder at what point the word temperature came in, because they, they must have known that you have to put a lot of fire underneath this thing to melt it, to get this or that to happen. So I, you know, there must have been a notion of that. I just don't know, uh, I don't know how it was characterized. Uh, I wonder whether the alchemists, um, had a notion of temperature. I'm I'm not immediately remembering um, a, a notion of temperature that those guys talked about. So it's an interesting question. I I don't know the um, uh, I I don't know, and I don't know whether alchemists had a um, uh, you know they they might have had a notion of you know um, you know the temperature at which quicksilver mercury freezes or you know, the temperature at which water boils, they might have had a notion of that. And that would mean that they would have had a word for temperature and so on. Um, I don't even know the etymology of the word temperature. So, okay, you guys have hit a, uh, a, a vein of, of lack of knowledge on my part that I should have, and I'm gonna look it up. Um, so thank you, for, um, thank you for raising that. All right, we've, we've gone much longer than I expected, but thanks for those interesting questions. I see a lot more that I'll be looking forward to um, to trying to address some um, when we do another one of these probably in about two weeks. So um, thanks very much for joining me and uh, see you another time. Bye for now.